Hi everyone, it's Dom from the MS Guide. Uh, something a bit different for you today. We're going to talk about medical cannabis. It's certainly a topic that comes up again and again in the MS community. And I'm very fortunate to have secured an expert, Dr. Leon Barron. Leon, hello. Hi Dom, thanks for having me on. Hi, it's my pleasure. Leon, can yeah. you... Just give us a quick synopsis of yourself. I mean, how did you get here, etc.? Because people never associate doctors with something that is in many quarters frowned upon. Okay, yeah, no, that's a good question. So, as you as you've kindly mentioned already, I'm a GP day to day. So, the bulk of my work is NHS clinical work. I do some out of hours one on one work. Uh, I also teach medical students at University College London. And um, I really came across medical cannabis just before the law was changed back in 2018 to allow cannabis on prescription. And this was around 2017, 2018. At that point, I really knew nothing about it. Um, but the more I learned about it and the more I um, read up on it and particularly reaching out to sort of overseas colleagues and looking at other countries where cannabis has been legal for some time now on prescription, I was kind of just blown away by it, basically thinking, wow, this is super, super interesting. This is a medicine. Um, this is a plant that has so many medical, interesting medical properties. But then the more I got to learn about the plant and the, and the space and the uh, meeting patients from overseas and meeting other doctors from the US and Israel and uh, Canada and so on, I started to realize it was not just being used for epilepsy, it was being used for all kinds of conditions. So, um, and actually it's backed, backed up by, by real science as well. So it's a whole world of interesting um, subject matter. And I think it, the applications are profound and we're kind of only just starting that journey here in the UK. It's an exciting space to be in because I, I can see the potential from a GP's perspective in, Terms of how this might help patients i mean i think the issue is it's it's freighted with a lot of baggage because of the societal thing so you know i want yeah. to get by that though i don't want to have a discussion because i suspect you and i are largely in agreement about the fact that it, it is a useful tool it's like amoxicillin is not for everybody but it's got its place and it's blinking useful Absolutely. you know when it's used appropriately but um i wonder i was hoping we could just sort of run through it essentially saying how does it work? And then okay. you know, we'll talk maybe a little bit about people with MS and, and, and where they want to use it. Really, how do people consume it? And then if we could wrap up and say, what's the current status in the UK? Because I know you've got some interesting stuff to talk to us about with that and some of the changes that are happening. So if we can dive right in, tell me, how does it work? <laughs> okay, how does it work? Well, we've all got an endocannabinoid system. That's something that it's still not taught largely at medical school, but this has not been known in the scientific literature for at least 30 years now. We've, well, this, this is widespread. It's all, every organ, in, practically every organ, every part of our body is affected by this system. Right. But the endocannabinoid system um, is a widespread um, system that we all have that basically fine tunes a lot of these messaging, uh, me a lot of these signals and messages. Okay, so um, really it's involved in almost every aspect of, of life, in our metabolism, uh, in the way that we uh, uh, feel pain or inflammation, um, muscle spasms, or everything really that's kind of mood, of course, is a, is a big application. So we all have this endocannabinoid system and we all produce natural chemicals in our body um, that sort of work in this system. Uh, one is called anandamide, one is called 2-AG, and we all produce these chemicals. Um, the interesting thing about the endocannabinoid system, it's not unique to humans. You find it across almost all vertebrates. They all have endocannabinoid systems. Now, the plant, the cannabis plant, happens to produce a lot of chemicals and molecules that directly interact with our own endocannabinoid systems. There are probably around 140 known cannabinoids. 
and they behind all, the drag curve on the detail. Well, no, but this is you know most people don't don't know that, um, and they all have interesting uh, medical problems. We're only just learnt, finding out about most of these. Um, this works. It's being discovered all the time, and often they work synergistically, and by that I mean they work together in combination mm. uh, to produce a, a desired effect or a certain effect. So um, the the cannabis plant produces chemicals that act, that can actively interact with our own um, systems throughout the body on, on all kinds of receptors, all kinds of target sites. So um, lots of interesting um, areas for it to target. And uh, like I said, we're still learning about how it kind of works in detail, but that's it kind of in its simplest form. Yeah, I think we need to take a step back um, and just talk briefly about the history of cannabis. So. The cannabis plant has been used for at least 6,000 years. There's a, about 6,000 years of documented use, medical use of, of cannabis. Okay. It goes all the way back to ancient China. Almost every civilization documents cannabis as a very useful medicine, um, primarily for pain and uh, epilepsy. Um, but also there's lots of interesting, if you go through the literature, you find in Greek mythology and ancient Judaism, all the really the big civilizations have used cannabis for obvious reasons. It's an interesting medicine. It works very well for certain things. So the drug really was um, was highly politicized in the 20th century um, by the U.S. government at the time. Um, it was really hijacked for um, for various reasons, largely to do with immigration to the U.S. So we've all grown up with this kind of very very much sort of polarized view on cannabis. A lot of deep stigma exists around mm. all the negative things that it can do. And as a result of prohibition and making cannabis illegal and not recognized as having any medical properties, what's happened over the years is that the street market, the illicit street market has produced cannabis that's very high in THC. So the average... Um, product that someone would find on the street market, the illicit market would be very high in THC. Most of it's called referred to as skunk, um, but it's not, uh, how can I put it? It's, it's quite different to the sort of medicine that might be given uh, on a prescription, um, which would be much generally much lower in THC and have higher levels of other cannabinoids, particularly of CBD. Um, when cannabis is prescribed for a patient, it mustn't be smoked. That's in the legislation, the UK law. So generally, if patients are being prescribed flour, dried flour, then uh, the advice would be that they vape the flour. So, um, so t tell me, since we're on this, tell me how uh, you, you vape it. You need to turn it in a way to get it into your body from the flour. So is, is yeah. vaping a form of burning in a different way? I mean, uh, typically a joint would have tobacco and, you know, which is considered pretty bad and uh, then cannabis in but this how does it work so let's kind of focus on a medical form of cannabis so look let's i accept the fact that in the on the black market illicit market people largely are smoking cannabis yeah um they and when you smoke something you combust it directly you apply a fire flame to the actual product itself yes you do get a desired effect but you also get lots of carcinogens and nasty things that are created from but the smoke essentially that's yeah. produced burning a plant. When you vape something, you heat it, and then you um, you're not directly uh, burning it. So you, you produce lots of interesting um, odors, if you like. Or uh, so, so is there machines to do this? I mean, I, yeah, I think, always think of those sort of pretend cigarettes, but is it like yeah. that? If if someone's prescribed flour, they can vape it through a, a, a vaporizer, a, a machine. Yeah. So a gadget. How, how do you get the machine? Does that get prescribed too? Do you have to buy no, it? It's not prescribed. There's a few brands that are generally recommended. Right. So so vaping get um, on, on Amazon or something. You know, it's yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's lots of patient groups that can sort of advise on those right. things. Okay. But flower is can generally I stop you for a sec. I will put all the links in the description, folks. Okay, if we'll you want to know about this stuff, like what they are, where to get them, you can look in the description. Okay. Sorry, Leon, carry on. No, no, that's good. You, that's going to be really useful. So patients at the moment in the UK are either being prescribed flour or oil, 
okay, cannabis oils that they'll take under the tongue. And generally speaking, the oils have a slow onset. So they'll work slowly and gradually. Mm -hmm. And the flower is used for breakthrough relief, usually right. for pain. Right. Okay. okay. So someone might be on an oil that they take morning and night, and then they take um, a few puffs of a, a vape throughout the day if they need something for breakthrough pain because it's much quicker onset. There are other forms of um, of taking cannabis that are perfectly legal, uh, although we're sort of not quite there yet in terms of that. There's not a wide range of products on, on in the market at the moment, but uh, you can take cannabis as a capsule, as a sort of um, encapsulated form, like a, you know, like we would with any other medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, there are patches, of course, um, uh, and I think as time, as we progress with this, we'll sort of see more advanced delivery mechanisms much more sort of metered vapes and uh metered dosing a bit like an inhaler or something like that so the, the products that are produced for medical use uh, have to be uh have to provide a certificate of analysis so the doctor and the patient can see all the different cannabinoids in that product and the ratios of each right. so most often people are started on a load of a high th a high, a high CBD strain of cannabis, whether it's an oil or, or a... Can you explain the CBD THC difference? Because I just see CBD stuff sort of everywhere and you think, is this real? Does it work? What is it? Yeah. So, so CBD is cannabidiol and it's one of the probably the most well-known cannabinoids. Uh, next, second in line to THC, which is right. which produces the high of cannabis, the intoxicating high. Now, interestingly... CBD counteracts THC. So if you start someone on a high strain of CBD, uh, high, uh, a cannabis strain that's high in CBD, uh, and then you slowly start to introduce THC, they're much, much less likely to feel high and spaced right. out. Right. The street cannabis, the illicit market generally, because it's produced for recreational use and, and to sort of to get high and, is very high in THC and it, a low, if not non-existent CBD. So you have none of that counteracting intoxication. So, so the strains that can be prescribed for medical use, you, you can know, although there's no kind of strict guidelines on dosing, and you mentioned amoxicillin where it's all sort of- Yeah, well, I mean- that was powerful, powerful, sort of, yeah. one, Three times a day. It's more the case of, there's a saying in cannabis growing, start low go slow and then you gradually titrate up right so it might take three or four weeks for the patient to really start to feel the benefit and so i mean we've established that it's legal under certain circumstances in the uk but yeah. this 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 is not an nhs doctor kind of thing is it i mean right now if somebody's watching this and they think i either get pain or spasticity or i want some relief from my symptoms of my my ms what would they do so the law, when it changed in 2018, only allows specialists to prescribe. Right. So your GP can't initiate a prescription for right. medical cannabis. Any specialist on the GMC register, any hospital consultant essentially can prescribe. Right. <clears throat> Albeit, largely, it has to be done in the private sector. So, which costs money, um, doesn't it? Which costs money. So there are quite a few clinics now that exist in the UK. Right. If you did a simple Google search, you'll find a list of medical cannabis clinics. Yeah. They I'm employ the details in, but yeah, they employ specialist doctors uh, to prescribe. Most of the prescribers are either pain specialists, uh, psychiatrists, and probably a third to that neurologists or general physicians. Right, and they're generally prescribing for chronic pain and um, anxiety and mood disorders. Um, or, or conditions like epilepsy and, and MS. Um, well, MS comes freighted with so many of them. You know, you can have anxiety, you that, can have mood disorders, you can have pain, spasticity. Yeah, exactly. It's worth pointing out, this is where I think there's some confusion, particularly this is relevant for anyone with MS. There are a, a few licensed medicines that exist in the UK that are cannabis-based medicines. You took the words out of my mouth. I was going to ask you about them. Now, by license, so there's two groups of medicines. Okay, 
um, you've got licensed medicines that have been through all the sort of pharma uh, ecological um, steps to get a drug to market, a bit more like traditional pharmaceutical drugs. Mm-hmm. And um, the t- and they've got MHRA approval. <clears throat> they're funded by, they're approved by NICE guidelines and they're generally funded by hospital trusts or CCGs. And you have a drug called Sativex. This is the one that everyone talks about. Which is licensed, it has a license for use in spasticity and MS. Mm-hmm. Now, Sativex is... Um, a cannabis-based medicine, and it has it's basically one-to-one ratio of CBD to THC. Mm-hmm. It's purified. That's that's what it contains, and it's a spray under the tongue. Right. So that would definitely be the first line. I think if you had MS and you're obviously suffering with spasticity, you should speak to your specialist about Sativex. So, because- Leon, this is where I hear. I mean, I haven't had I haven't had to try and get it for myself, but. I hear people generally saying this is nearly impossible to get. So in theory, it's available, but they okay. also are consultant and then just get knocked back. Right. Well, it's it's produced in the UK to start with. It's a, it's a UK company that makes this and it's licensed. It has approval for use in MS uh, for specific, specifically for spasticity. So. You know, I think if you're getting that response from the specialist and you have that a, a need for satellites, you should uh, you should raise that again or escalate that uh, request because there's no reason why that should not be funded and um, and prescribed for you. The the other medicines I was talking about earlier, which are in essence very similar, they come they all come from the cannabis part. Mm-hmm. They're they're largely unlicensed medicines. Right. Okay. So they've not been through the vigorous checks that you get for a normal sort of pharma right. uh, pharma type drug but they work very well often and yeah. anecdotally a lot of patients that i've met ms pa- people with ms who have tried sativex have found it doesn't work that well but sometimes they may go to the private sector and be prescribed a different strain of cannabis that's got lots of cannabinoids in it and lots of other kind of active um, compounds with it, and they've Fine then. Okay, now I'm starting to see a response. I'm starting to see an improvement. Okay. But they're unlicensed. They're not funded for, and they have to be paid for right. privately. Give me, and I, I know that everybody's different in terms of the actual variation they need and the actual dose they need. But if I was going to get going with a private medical medical cannabis prescription, yeah, all the details will be in the description. But I would need to buy a vaporizer, probably. Um, if I was going to get prescribed flour and um, then, I mean, how much is this stuff? I mean, as a monthly cost, are you looking at 20 quid a month, a hundred quid a month? How much does the doctor consultation cost? I mean, I, I have no idea about this, but I know people will want to know about the money. It's not cheap. And, you know, this is a real hurdle and a barrier to sort of wider prescribing. Unfortunately, it's not funded for. And it, there'll be a cost for the patient to see the doc, see a doctor, private consultation. A lot of the clinics have lowered their prices, so they'll have a, an offer for an initial consultation. So is that a hundred quid, or is that is that could be something like that? Hundred could be say in the region of hundred pounds. Right. Okay. It depends on the the price per month for a script. This is a controlled drug as well, so it has to be prescribed every month. Yeah. You can't you can't have a three month prescription. <laughs> no, no, no. What do you think? When it first arrived in, in the marketplace a few years ago, people people were spending a thousand pounds, two thousand pounds a month. That's a lot. Now, now the price has come down to probably on average about three hundred pounds a month. It's still a lot of money. Um, and how frequent do you need to keep paying to see the doctor, or is it that one off one hundred pound ish hit? It depends, Dom. It depends on the condition and what's being treated right. for. But generally, there's there'll be a follow up after a few weeks, and then. Um, it could be every few months that the doctor is sort of actually seeing you. There, a lot of the clinics are now employing nurse practitioners or pharmacists or other people to sort of do those follow-up consultations. So the patients aren't necessarily paying a consultant fee for a, a follow-up. So you pay for a private prescription every month. You pay for the drug itself every month. You then, every several months, you pay for a follow-up because, you know, and, I mean, no doctor's really going to set you off um unmonitored with a drug no that's true listen yes. it's not cheap 
and and yeah. you know the, the nice who essentially control the nhs if you like they certainly control it from a funding point of view yeah. and the uh, cost effectiveness they don't see enough evidence as things down to 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 fund unlicensed cannabis based medicines right okay. you know it's very different in other countries and uh and, and i hope to see the price continue to come down so there's about one and a, almost one and a half million people who are paying probably in the region of a couple of hundred pounds a month just to access cannabis that they know nothing about they don't know where it's grown where and it comes also from. you know you you end up stepping into what is considered the illegality side of things so yeah. you yeah. Put all the stress place in. yourself at risk and stress yeah, yeah they, these are a lot of unwell patients exactly who are putting themselves through this extra stress leon i mean i feel like this is something we could talk about forever and ever and ever before we go though i know that you mentioned briefly and we will do another video and catch up in six to eight weeks time i'm having the yeah. minor thing of lemtrada in the middle but you know, okay. tell us very briefly about this register that you are compiling oh yes yeah. so well i'm i'm mainly involved in education of doctors so um the main project I, I help to run is the Medical Cannabis Clinician Society. I also have a group of for GPs called the Primary Care Cannabis Network. Uh, the latest project we're building out is basically a, a directory of independent prescribers. So it's, it's listing specialists who are trained and competent in prescribing medical cannabis. Essentially, patients can just go online and find a doctor, right. either by location or by condition. And they'll go and see that doctor directly not not within a medical cannabis clinic. but that's not launched yet but when it is we'll have a catch-up and i'll also yeah. then provide but, details of that to everybody yeah that, that'd be fantastic all right hey yeah. leon look i really appreciate you taking your time today so and i look forward to catching up with you in six to eight weeks time amazing all right Dom. Thank thanks you. a lot take thank care